Chapter Thirty of The Humbugs of the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in September two thousand and nine. The Humbugs of the World by P. T. Barnum. Chapter Thirty. Monsignore Cristoforo Riccio or il creso the nostrum vendor of florence a model for our quack doctors every visitor to florence during the last twenty years must have noticed on the grand piazza before the ducal palace the strange genius known as monsignore creso or in plain english mr croesus he is so called because of his reputed grand wealth but his real name is cristoforo riscio which i may again translate as christopher risk Mrs. Browning refers to him in one of her poems, The Casa Guidi Windows, I think, and he has also been the staple of a tale by one of the Trollope brothers. Twice every week he comes into the city in a strange vehicle, drawn by two fine Lombardy ponies, and unharnesses them in the very centre of the square. His assistant, a capital vocalist, begins to sing immediately, and the crowd soon collects around the wagon. Then Monsignore takes from the box beneath his seat a splendidly joined human skeleton, which he suspends from a tall rod and hook, and also a number of human skulls. The latter are carefully arranged on an adjustable shelf, and Creso takes his place behind them, while in his rear a perfect chemist's shop of flasks, bottles, and pill-boxes is disclosed. Very soon his singer ceases, and in the purest Tuscan dialect, the very utterance of which is music, the Florentine quack doctor proceeds to address the assemblage. Not being conversant with the Italian, I am only able to give the substance of his harangue, and pronounce indifferently upon the merit of his elocution. I am assured, however, that not only the common people, who are his chief patrons, but numbers of the most intelligent citizens, are always entertained by what he has to say, and certainly his gestures and style of expression seem to betray great excellence of oratory. Having turned the skeleton round and round on its pivot, and minutely explained the various anatomical parts, in order to show his proficiency in the basis of medical science, he next lifts the skulls, one by one, and discounts upon their relative perfection, throwing in a shrewd anecdote now and then, as to the life of the original owner of each cranium. One skull, for example, he asserts to have belonged to a lunatic, who wandered for half a lifetime in the Valdema, subsisting precariously upon entirely vegetable food, roots, herbs, and the like. Another is the superior part of a convict, hung in Arezzo for numerous offences. A third is that of a very old man, who lived a celibate from his youth up, and by his abstinence and goodness exercised an almost priestly influence upon the Borghese. When, by this miscellaneous lecture, he has both amused and edified his hearers, he ingenuously turns the discourse upon his own life, and finally introduces the subject of the marvellous cures he has effected. The story of his medical preparations alone, their components and method of distillation, is a fine piece of popularized art, and he gives a practical exemplification of his skill and their virtues by calling from the crowd successively a number of invalid people, whom he examines and prescribes for on the spot. Whether these subjects are provided by himself or not, I am unable to decide, but it is very possible that by a long experience Cristoforo, who has no regular diploma, has mastered the simpler elements of materia medica, and does in reality effect cures. I class him among what are popularly known as humbugs, however, for he is a pretender to more wisdom than he possesses. It was to me a strange and suggestive scene, the bald, beak-nosed, coal-eyed charlatan, standing in the market-place, so celebrated in history, peering through his gold spectacles at the upturned faces below him, while the bony skeleton at his side swayed in the wind, and the grinning skulls below made grotesque faces, as if laughing at the gullibility of the people. Behind him loomed up the massive Palazzo Vecchio, with its high tower, sharply cut, and set with deep machicolations, to the left the splendid loggia of Organia, filled with rare marbles, and the long picture gallery of the Uffizi, heaped with the rarest art treasures of the world. To his right, the giant fountain of Amanato, throwing jets of pure water. 
one drop of which outvalues all the nostrums in the world and in front the post office built centuries before by pisan captives if any of these things moved the imperturbable creso he showed no feeling of the sort but for three long hours two days in the week held his hideous clinic in the open daylight seeing the man so often and interested always in his manner as much so indeed as the peasants or contadini who bought his vials and pill-boxes without stint i became interested to know the main features of his life and by the aid of a friend got some clues which i think reliable enough to publish i do so the more willingly because his career is illustrative after an odd fashion of contemporary italian life he was the son of a small farmer not far from siena and grew up in daily contact with wine dresses and olive gatherers living upon the hard tuscan fare of macaroni and maroon nuts with a cutlet of lean mutton once a day and a pint of sour tuscan wine being tolerably well educated for a peasant boy he imbibed a desire for the profession of an actor and studied alfieri closely some little notoriety that he gained by recitations led him in an evil hour to venture an appearance en grand role in florence at a third-rate theatre his father had meanwhile deceased and left him the property but to make the debut referred to he sold almost his entire inheritance as may be supposed his failure was signal however easy he had found it to amuse the rough untutored peasantry of his neighbourhood the test of a large and polished city was beyond his merit so poor and abashed he sank to the lower walks of dramatic art singing in choruses at the opera playing minor parts in show-pieces and all the while feeling the sting of disappointed ambition and half-deserved penury one day found him at the beginning of winter without work and without a soldo in his pocket passing a druggist's shop he saw a placard asking for men to sell a certain new preparation the druggist advanced him a small sum for travelling expenses and he took to peripathetic lectures at once going into the country and haranguing at all the villages here he found his dramatic education available though not good enough for an actor he was sufficiently clever for a nomadic eulogizer of a patent medicine his vocal abilities were also of service to him in gathering the people together the great secret of success in anything is to get a hearing half the object is gained when the audience is assembled well poor vagabond peddling christopher risk selling so much for another party conceived the idea of becoming his own capitalist he resolved to prepare a medicine of his own and profiting by the assistance of a young medical student obtained bona fide prescriptions for the commonest maladies these he had made up in gross originated labels for them and concealing the real essences thereof by certain harmless adulterations began to advertise himself as the discoverer of a panacea to gain no ill-will among the priests whose influence is paramount with the peasantry he dexterously threw in a reverent word for them in his nomadic harangues and now and then made a sounding present to the church he profited also by the superstitions abroad and to the skill of hippocrates added the roguery of simon magus by report he was both a magician and a physician and the knack that he had of sleight of hand was not the least influential of his virtues his bodily prowess was as great as his suppleness one day at fiesole a foreign doctor presumed to challenge monsignore to a debate and the offer was accepted while the two stood together in cristoforo's wagon and the intruder was haranguing the people the quack without a movement of his face or a twitch of his body jerked his foot against his rival's leg and threw him to the ground he had the effrontery to proclaim the feat as magnetic entirely accomplished without bodily means and by virtue of his black art acquirements an awe fell upon the listeners and they refused to hear the checkmated disputant further as soon as cristoforo began to thrive he indulged his dramatic taste by purchasing a superb wagon team and equipments and hired a servant such a turnout had never been seen in tuscany since the medician days it gained for him the name of creso straightway and enabling him to travel more rapidly enlarged his business sphere and so vastly increased his profits he arranged regular days and hours for each place in tuscany and soon became as widely known as the grand duke himself when it was known that he had bought an old castle at pontasieve on the banks of the arno his reputation still further increased he was now so prosperous that he set the faculty at defiance 
he proclaimed that they were jealous of his profounder learning and threatened to expose the banefulness of their systems at the same time his talk to the common people began to savour of patronage and this also enhanced his reputation it is much better as a rule to call attention up to you rather than charity down to you the shrewd imposture became also more absolute now it was known that the grand duke had once asked him to dine and that monsignore had the hardihood to refuse indeed he sympathized too greatly with the aroused italian spirit of unity and progress to compromise himself with the house of austria when at last the revolution came cristoforo was one of its best champions in tuscany his cantate sang only the march of garibaldi and the victories of savoy his own speeches teemed with the gospel of italy regenerated and for a whole month he wasted no time in the sale of his botigias and pilolas but threw all his vehement persuasive and dramatic eloquence into the popular cause the end we know tuscany is a dukedom no longer but a component part of a great peninsular kingdom with florence the beautiful for its capital and still before the ducal palace where the deputies of italy are to assemble poor vain cristoforo riscio makes his harangue every tuesday and saturday he is now or was four years ago upward of sixty years of age but spirited and athletic as ever and so rich that it would be superfluous for him to continue his peripatetic career his life is to me noteworthy as showing what may be gained by concentrating even humble energies upon a paltry thing had Creso persevered as well upon the stage, I do not doubt that he would have made a splendid actor. If he did so well with a mere nostrum, why should he not have gained riches and a less grotesque fame by the sale of a better article? He understood human nature, its credulities and incredulities, its superstitions, tastes, changefulness, and love of display and excitement. He has done no harm and given as much amusement as he has been paid for indeed i consider him more an ornamental and useful character than otherwise he has brightened many a traveller's recollections relieved the tedium of many a weary hour in a foreign city and with all his deception has never severed himself from the popular faith nor sold out the popular cause i dare say his death when it occurs will cause more sensation and evoke more tears than that of any better physician in tuscany End of chapter 30